the white silhouette was written in, in response to an invitation by John F. Dean to a number of poets to write a poem that explored their relationship with Christ, if any. And for me, this was a fascinating challenge since I've had a complex relationship with Christ or Jesus as I prefer to see him. I come from a family that's been associated with the Church of Ireland for many generations. And my Quaker-educated mother was interested in more esoteric forms of spirituality. And so religion and spirituality have always been part of my atmosphere and have propelled me into a constant exploration of spiritual truth. This poem has an epigraph, which is from a book by Stephen Graham, a travel writer. And the book's called With the Russian Pilgrims to Jerusalem, published in 1913. And it goes, There went a whisper round the decks one morning, we have a mysterious passenger on board. Often I thought of that rumor after we reached Jerusalem. When I saw the man all in white by the golden gate, carrying in all weathers his lighted lamp, I always thought there is a mysterious pilgrim in Jerusalem. The White Silhouette for John F. Dean. I thought we would meet in a holy place, like the church in the hamlet of Bishopstone, empty on a Wiltshire summer's day, the trees full of rooks and hung in green, and the stream in the meadows a rush of darkling silver beneath the bridge, where I saw my first kingfisher flash its needle, leaving a turquoise stitch in my memory. And I would sit in the church and close my eyes and wait in vain for something to ignite and wonder whether this was my life, wasting away in my mother's home. Sometimes I'd bring Herbert's temple and read the quiet order of his poems and picture him as once he was glimpsed, hugging the floor in his church at Bemerton, asking love to bid him welcome. I sat with an upright praying disposition, preoccupied in self-combing, too callow and spiritually impatient to notice if you had slipped in as a tourist to inspect the choir or font and buy a picture postcard and sign the book with lovely atmosphere. Or as a walker taking refuge from rain or a woman primping flowers by the altar. Or somewhere like the island of Patmos, out of season and the tourist flow, the sea leaching blue from the skies. In the cave of St. John, pointillist gold on tips of candles and highlights of icons, you might have visited that day in September when I was there, absorbing the coolness, imagining John on the day of the Lord, prostrate on the ground, as if before a throne. And you, not dressed in a robe and gold sash, nor with hair as white as wool or snow, but as a pilgrim with camera and rucksack, respectful, curious, guidebook in hand, appreciating the grain of raw stone, catching my eye and pausing for a second as if I were a school friend from years ago. I never saw you if you were there, for I was too blinded by the new Jerusalem, flashing out jasper, topaz, sapphire, descending from heaven like a huge regal crown. Or somewhere like Holy Cross in Tipperary, the abbey at the meeting of road and river, you might have stopped to break a journey, as I often do, and see me there in the nave, ambling down the sloping floor towards the relic splinter of the cross, or sitting outside on the banks of the shore, on a bench on a swathe of tended grass. Perhaps that day when, heading north, 
I pause by the car park to watch a bride, fragile and frozen by the door, her bridesmaids huddled in the cold of March, waiting and waiting to make her entrance into the sudden shine of turning faces, like a swan gliding in its snowdress from an arch of the bridge in a state of grace. I was too mesmerized by her destiny to see you start your car, drive off, and raise your hand as you pass me by on the way to Cashel, Fermoy, and the South. But there was that time I was so certain that I had finally found you. Sick at home, I turned to meditation and prayer to overcome self-pity, for weeks accumulating quietude, till that morning when seconds were emptied out, my thoughts cleansed, myself destroyed within an uncanny, infusing light that seemed to deepen and unfold more layers of radiance and lay me wide open so you could cross the threshold, or I could cross at any moment. But I closed the door of my heart, afraid, who knows, that I might have met you, afraid I would pass to the other side and never return to all that I knew. I thought I could always reopen myself and greet you properly, well prepared. I never did. I feared that sudden shift into the zone of timelessness. Too scared, I looked for you in public. For safety, I kneeled in churches, gave the sign of peace in St. James's Piccadilly. I recited prayers, took bread and wine, and I concentrated so hard, but failed to believe they were your blood and body. I heard staccato prayers, like nails banged in, as if to board up windows. Sometimes I'd sense you as a glimmer, as in that dream I once had out of the blue, when you stood at night on a Greek island shore. Your face was hidden, but it was you. The stars pinned in place the layers of darkness. Then came the comets, perhaps a dozen, their tails fanned out with diminishing sparks. Slowly they twisted and turned, your hands moving in concert, as if you were guiding them, as if they were on strings like Chinese kites. The comet slowed and stopped and changed into letters of Hebrew, emblazoning the night. And I knew if I could grasp those words, your silent message across the stars, I'd know my destiny on earth. Instead, I woke as puzzled as Belshazzar. I do not search for you anymore. I don't know whom to seek or where. Too weary, disillusioned, I'm not sure what I think or if I really care that much. My last hope that my resignation might be a sign of the via negativa, a stage of my self-abnegation, that hope prevents the thing it hopes for. And yet, I still write to you, poem after poem, trying to shape the perfect pattern of words and the mystery of their rhythm, an earthly music audible in heaven. Each poem is a colored flare, a distress signal, an outflowing of myself, a camouflage prayer dispatch towards the cloud of unknowing. And all I have to do is stay where I am, ready to be rescued, not move, speak or think, but wait for the brightening of the cloud, for your white silhouette to break free from it and come nearer, nearer, till I see your essence and I can ask where in the world you were throughout my days. And only then will I grasp why I never found you, because you were too close to home, because I thought I'd have to die to see you there, right there, removing the lineaments of your disguise. My careworn, wrinkled skin, my jaded incarnation of your eyes, 
my face becoming your face, my eyes your eyes, I you us, I you us, Jesus.